following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. A very good evening everyone, welcome to another episode of Get Real where we talk to notable newsmakers in our country, uh, try to get a different perspective uh, other than that is uh, there in the mainstream media to educate you, understand and actually uh, be part of the conversation rather than uh, you know just going with the flow. Uh, there are lots of issues in our country in terms of the economy that is not something that you are uh, you know exclusively that you're finding out right now uh, we know politically we have issues in terms of um, how the nation is moving forward um, elections are again uh, in the cards we don't know whether there will be elections this year or not uh, so lot, lots to talk uh, and for that um, I have the pleasure uh, in the be um, being in the midst of uh, Minister of Water Supply and Estate Infrastructure, Jeevan Thunderman. Welcome to the program. Good to see you and thank you for being here, uh, Minister. Thank you for having me. Uh, Minister, let me start off uh, with an uh, obvious question about the economy, which is what everybody uh, wants to know. Where we are we heading? Now, the economy seems to be stable. Uh, people are getting there supplies, um, there is no uh, queues uh, in the society right now as we used to see uh, last year. Uh, things are being told by all entities that the economy is stabilizing. The central bank is saying, the government is saying. But the opposition is very swift to uh, pounce on that and say, no, no, this, this is a fake stabilization because no sooner we start paying the loans, then we will be again in the crisis. What I need to know is, uh, it's not about, I mean, obviously we are going to be in crisis as, as we move on in, uh, uh, as we go on. Does the government have a plan when we start to uh, make the payments, um, you know, when, when that starts jolting the economy, does the government have a plan? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, just to uh, debunk a few myths, I mean, as you rightly said, the opposition, you know, they're quite swift on uh, countering any of the government's reforms by, uh, you know, always claiming something that, you know, is eventually going to happen. For example, before we had stabilized the country, there was harsh criticism on the president, you know, close to his appointment as well, that uh, one, he was unelected, two, that he's not going to be able to get the country out of this mess, three, that he's going to be the puppet of certain political leaders, and four, he's going to be acting in their political interests. But in reality, I think the past um, close to seven to eight months, have shown visible progress, not just in terms of legislative reforms, but also in terms of uh, ground reality. So as the president was able to move past, you know, every uh, potential uh, criticism uh, that was put, uh, given by the opposition, we also have to realize in terms of economy how far we've come. See, you take a look at September 2022. I think we created a record. Mm. The inflation was at 70%, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Today, the same inflation rate has reduced to close to 25%. And you asked earlier where we are heading towards. Well, we're heading towards the third quarter of 2023. And as forecasted, you know, we are on the right path. And uh, another, just an important clarification I need to make is as the president was able to debunk these criticisms put forth by the opposition, the opposition ran out of things to, uh, you know, uh, well, instigate fear amongst the people and instigate a lack of faith over the president. So they resorted to the second aspect. Okay, now since the economy has stabilized, right, so the next thing is we have to restart our debt repayments. So obviously the dollar rate would go up as well, it's obvious. And uh, the opposition is saying, ah, oh, see the dollar rate is going up again, we're back to square one. No, if it wasn't for the president, then we won't even be in a situation where we can talk about debt repayments. What made you to say that we are not back to square one because if the dollar rate is going 
up again and that was the indicator last year also suddenly we had a huge uh, uh, influx of the dollar and that was real uh, the the people couldn't take that everything started going uh, up uh, why do you say that it would not happen this time? No, because as I already mentioned earlier, the price of goods that needed to be bought in September 2022, it was unimaginable. People are not in a situation where they could even afford two, three meals a day. But right now, and the only difference between last year and this year, last year, again, we were not in a position to repay our debts where we even declared bankruptcy, where, you know, I think we were even downgraded by various institutions. Yeah. But this year, we are in a position where we, I'm not saying we're out of crisis, please don't mistake me on that. What I'm trying to say is, we have, you know, uh, built somewhat of a base, it, you know, as opposed to last year, where we can actually think about coming up with a mechanism where we have to repay our debt. So if the opposition were to be constructive, if they were willing to be cooperative and constructive, then they should come forth. They have esteemed individuals like Honorable Ehran Vikramaratna, Harsha De Silva, Kabir Hashim, they can come forth and give us a plan and work with us on how we can do our debt repayment along with protecting the weaker section of society. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think the government is planning to spend about 206 billion rupees uh, in social protection programs. Apart from that, we've also identified four different classes of, uh, well, the vulnerable section of society, if I may, the severely poor to vulnerable. And uh, all of them would be getting payments and that is with external help as well. And even now the president has gone to France to speak to the Paris Club. So all these are improvements. I'm not saying we're out of danger, but we are a step closer to safety is what I was trying to say. One of the things that people lament, uh, this is actually, we see it on daily news, is the fact that yes, uh, the inflation is coming down and all the other indicators are showcasing to us saying that apparently things are uh, on the right track. But people are not feeling it uh, at the market. When they go, the prices are still high. Vendors are not uh, ready to put the prices down. When the dollar rate is uh, you know, coming down, the, the vendors are not going like, you very well know if you go, so no, 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 we bought it prior to when the dollar was at the highest rate. And that benefit is not being given to the people. So that particular problem arises even though when you say this, but you, I go to the market and I still find high prices to pay, it doesn't make sense. True, but uh, if I may just uh, interject and just clarify one piece of information. See, I, I came to this very same studio, I think a month ago, and I explained something where this issue was inherited, not just from the former government, but all, all successive governments that have come mm -hmm. in. You know, it's been terrible fiscal mismanagement, and more than that, you know, we were trying to run a populist welfare yeah. state yeah. when we didn't have the means to. See, I agree, free education, free healthcare is a must, but the amount of freebies and social welfare that we had given in addition in return for votes, that is just far too high. So due to all those decisions, it eventually led us to even touch our government sector. For a population of 22 million, we need only 400,000 government servants. We have 1.8 million. So I'm just trying yeah, to put yeah, this yeah. out there because the reason why the you know the the price of goods is so high, where you know cost of living is high, it's not just because of this government or the former government or whatnot. It's because continuous, uh, inconsistent decisions is what I have to say. So, given the cards that have been dealt, this is a time where we can actually do course correction. Aragalia, yeah, maybe, maybe certain politicians feel that Aragalia was politicized, was this, was that. But in my opinion, Aragalia was inevitable. It was bound to happen, whether it's politicized or not. It's secondary. But we were heading towards that and it's good in a way because it's given a reality check. So now when we are setting our house in order, yes, tough decisions need to be made. But if these decisions aren't going to be made, then we are forever going to, you know, just extend this period of uh, difficulty. And also I'd, I'd like to disagree on one matter. See, though uh, recently we had even increased the electricity cost by 66%. And uh, yes, that's a burden on people too, but then again, years of mismanagement and uh, my... So that's the question, Minister, that everybody... Sorry, if I may just yeah. complete. So though we increased electricity costs, we were able to make sure we could offset the accounts and bring down the cost of certain other essentials. I mean, in an ideal world, we'd like to give especially food uh, essentials for a cheaper rate, but that's not possible right now given our cost. So what we are trying to do is, yes, we're trying to fix our house in separate orders, but at the same time, we're also trying to lower the price of goods Recently, I believe even the cost of a loaf of bread had come down. It was the very cost of bread that instigated this entire issue. Yeah, yeah. So, slow steps. Again, like I said, we're not out of danger, but we're getting there. 
Minister, that's the biggest question. You very uh, uh, pertinently said that this is not just one year of mismanagement or two years of mismanagement. Uh, it was a, a systematic mismanagement from, I think, from the 70s onwards. We, we continuously mismanage our economy. So now the bill of that mismanagement has to be paid by the current citizens of this country. Is that fair? Because these people g trusted the politicians, gave them the power, they took this entire decision-making process and took us to this particular point. Now, is it fair to ask the public to cough it up again? Because the public don't have more money to give uh, when the taxes are going up. If the salary is also going high, then definitely we can negotiate and say, yeah, it makes sense. But that's not the case today. Uh, uh, you very well know if you were getting 30,000 rupee a salary, maybe the increment would have been 5,000 rupees, which is menial to most of these individuals. So how can you justify, how can the government justify that we have to come out of this by making the people pay again? No, see, I never said at any point that it is fair for people to suffer right now because of the mistakes of the past. But instead of looking at it in retrospect, mm. instead of sitting and, you know, uh, wondering where did we go wrong, how did we go wrong, who should be facing the music, Philippines is the perfect example. I mean, Ferdinand Marcos, at the end of the day, his corruption at that point of time stood at 20 or 30 billion dollars. And how much was the government able to uh, retrieve? Barely, barely three mm. billion dollars. And that is thinking in retrospect. No one's going to move forward. Yes, accountability is a must. But the only thing is we can learn from the failures of our past. That is how we should think in retrospect. Rather than sitting and pointing fingers, we should take a moment where we can self-reflect and say, okay, this, so, if I may complete, that this is where the leaders have gone wrong and that's what we need to fix about ourselves. Now, I'm a young politician. Yeah, exactly. There are many young politicians. What we can do is we should learn from the mistakes of the past and make sure the country stays consistently on a healthy path rather than sit look back in the past and say okay fine maybe maybe we we can maybe we can point a finger at the other party looking at the past right now if you look at the major but that's parties happening in, in the parliament if you members. look at the major parties in parliament right now all of them have been in power at some point of time yes in the past it's been an equal power share the former government i agree accelerated our demise that is what we have to accept over here but also without forgetting the past it's about our ability to move forward which is what I think we are doing right now. Just like you said, if you are a young politician and if we are learning from our mistakes, are you satisfied right now uh, with regard to the action that is being taken by this government, knowing the fact that we are not repeating the same mistakes? Six months ago, we couldn't venture out anywhere. I'm not talking about politicians. I'm talking about even middle class working uh, the section of society. You know, fuel queues, as you were aware, were kilometers long. The food queues were even worse. In the estate sector, Poverty went from 13%, it jumped up to 21, and now it's at 44. But the World Bank report states it might be at 52 even. So all these issues were in existence six months ago. And I think it is only because of the government's directives and reform structure, we were able to, I, again, we didn't move out of danger, but we were able to rectify it and see how we can lead the country out of this mess. See, in, in, in economic terms, if I may say so, now, even the IMF report, the forecast has clearly said that, yes, uh, negative growth is, was at 7.8%, now it's reduced to 3%. And hopefully by next year, again, this is only if we stay on that path. And if we stay on that path, hopefully by next year we would experience a growth economy, even though it might be a slight one. But again, these all are probabilities. Right now, the political situation where we are at right now, yes, we are able to take things forward. But at the end of the day, it is going to require the cooperation of all entities in Parliament. You know, we always just fix this uh, perspective at SLPP alone. But in reality, like you said, you know, the opposition, they need to come and do their due diligence. And we did well. never, uh, we never saw that union uh, occurring, even at the thick of this economic crisis, all what we saw in parliament, which, you know, most of the parliamentarians, uh, you know, give really good voice cuts to the media outside, but inside, whenever we see, we did not see a difference of conducting business prior to the economic crisis and after the uh, economic crisis it's still the finger pointing you know the useless conversations that are occurring with regard to somebody else's personal issues or some of that matter 
where can the people see, because you are, uh, as you correctly said, you are a very young politician who is uh, leading a, a, a cabinet ministerial position, which is, which is very important. Now, being there, if you get fed up of uh, uh, politics in another two or three years because of the way we are conducting, uh, you know, that's a loss to the country. Now, where do you see the change? Because we honestly don't, from the point of uh, perspective that we are in, looking at the parliament, we see that the government is screaming the same way they used to scream. I, I'm not pointing fingers at this particular party. If the government is in, government wants to basically scream, and we see the opposition responding. And then there is this, you know, good, good, it's fun to watch. But, you know, fun is not what people expect right now. They want credible action that would bring them results. Well, I think, uh, with all due respect, I think you're watching the wrong parliamentarian speak in parliament then, if that's the case. <laughs> no, because, see, realistically speaking, it depends on what you want to see. If you want to see this, uh, you know, playing to the gallery, people screaming at each other, then yes, uh, you know, I'll get you a gallery pass. You're more than welcome to come sit in parliament and have a hands-on experience. So but you're telling me it doesn't reality happen? Is, reality is, I would like more details on that, because from where I sit, from where I see, the changes that have been taking place in the gap in the government within the cabinet and the impact it's had on the people and it's been a positive impact that's undeniable if i can just say a few number one just to give an example we have taken steps to ensure that i think it'll be coming up in a few months as well that the central bank becomes more independent and it's in fact more empowered to function without the interference of politicians and whatnot which is a primary issue Apart from that, I've always been a strong believer of you cannot attain economic progress without having social progress. And in terms of social progress, we have the gender and uh, women empowerment bill that's coming up. And along with that, I think even 365, 365A was repealed recently. And I mean, it's yet to be put in parliament. And apart from that, with the social sector, a protection program is coming in place. And similarly, if you look at the economic sector, I personally think the president has done phenomenally in that particular aspect, not because I'm part of his cabinet and not because I have any political allegiance to him, I would just like to say that. But it's because of the fact that, you know, um, just take a look at uh, Honorable Minister Kanchan of Sikura's ministry. Reforms that were supposed to take place for so many years, it has been kept under the table and it's just been gathering dust. And all we needed was some a minister who was empowered by an equally capable president to push forward these reforms. I mean, I mean you were saying that you, you, you know, you never thought you would see the union of, you know, such political yeah, entities. Yeah. Similarly, I never thought that anybody would be able to set the government systems and mechanisms in place, and it's happening. And this, this consequence, the impact of this, will be felt eventually. These are not short-term changes that we are bringing into the fray. These are long-term programs. For example, with relation to, if I may say so, with relation to the estate sector, even. Now, I, even before elections, regardless of whichever party we were aligned with, we always took the stand that we don't believe in a daily wage model. We believe it's outdated. And at the end of the day, the real people who are losing out are the plantation workers. It's not anybody else. The companies are enjoying their tax breaks. They're enjoying all the benefits. So in reality, one of the main reasons for us to support the president was the president is the only one who had spoken about the estate workers and how to change their mod modality of working. So apart from that, there are changes that will come in. All I'm suggesting is, the changes would be much faster had we the cooperation of all entities. A uh, lot more to discuss uh, with uh, Minister Jeevan Thondaman uh, with regard to uh, lots of uh, other matters. I also want to get, uh, ju just as he touched on the estate sector, I want to uh, dive deep into that as well. But before that, let's take a short commercial break. You're watching Get Real with we'll Rabba. Welcome back, everyone, to Get Real. I'm in conversation with the Minister of Water Supply and Estate Infrastructure, Jeevan Thondaman. We've been talking a lot uh, with regard to the economy right now, and uh, we're trying to understand exactly where the country is heading. Uh, I want to talk about the estate sector, um, Minister. You are the minister in charge of that sector, and one thing that I really want to know, uh, because I, I I grew up in... in, in uh, um, in upcountry and I went to school there 
and I know exactly uh, I've been into estates, you know, family has a lot of connections to that and we've been there. And one thing is that the uh, people who live in these sectors, um, mostly, I mean, those days it was known as lying giver. That's what they've been housed at. It's still it's, known as lying <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but their conditions have not changed dramatically or drastically for the past, I would say, 50 years. Where are the reforms on that? I'm sure right now with the economic crisis, they would have got hammered even worse than anyone else. And their issue is not discussed the same way issues of the people in Colombo be, is being discussed. How do you see that and what kind of steps are you taking in order to solve uh, the issues pertaining to your ministry? Well, firstly, uh, I'm sorry to make this a habit in your interview, but again, I strongly disagree with what you just said because you know, we talk about the estate sector and one thing I've realized about the estate sector and the Sri Lankan community is that people in Sri Lanka, they see only what they want to see. They, they want to see poverty, they will see only poverty. I'm not saying that the estate sector are safe and they are not a vulnerable group, they are a vulnerable group. But we have a long way to go. But using that as a reason to negate how far we've come is frankly How far have we unjust. come? Because so let me explain something. What many people don't know in Sri Lanka is the history of the estate sector. For example, uh, when did Sri Lanka get independence? May I ask you? 48. When did the estate sector get independence? I think they're still... No, I mean, I mean on paper, legally. Uh, somewhere around in the 70s? Correct. And we lost our independence in 48. And we received our civic rights only in 77. But there's another catch in that. It's not just 77. We received total citizenship in 2003. And that, you know, that fact, it somehow, uh, you know, it, it disappears. And which is why I stress on the importance of the history of the estate sector. You know, it should be added in the school syllabus. People should know. And apart from going through 30 years of, just, uh, just to give perspective, we went through 30 years of being stripped of our civic rights. 30 more years of being collateral damage in a war which we did not take part in. Then apart from that, we have constant workplace exploitation. And this workplace exploitation is the primary reason to why the estate sector people are in a pathetic living condition. People have believed or, you know, they've, they've had this tendency to weave this narrative that the unions and the political representatives are the reason the estate sector aren't, you know, uh, where they're supposed to be which I disagree with because I'm willing to sit, in fact, how I sit with you, with anyone and provide ample evidence on why exploitation is the reason as opposed to lack of political representation. To give you in terms of numbers, earlier there were 535,000 workers, I'm talking about barely 30, 40 years ago, 535,000 workers. And due to the lack of dignity at their workplace, the, work, uh, the workforce today has uh, reduced to 135,000. Now, I want you to keep in mind that the, the estate sector families, the population is close to 1.5 million, right? And earlier, I'm talking about the 60s, we were on par with the Northern Tamils. We were close to, this, uh, close to being the second largest ethnicity. But there was an inhumane pact drawn up, the Srima Shastri Pact, where close to 40% of our population was forcibly repatriated to India. So all these injustices, people are not aware about. And right now, what we are dealing with is a lot of hypocrisy. Now, I understand uh, my party, my family in particular, because I know that would be a follow-up question. Though our party is one of the oldest parties in this country, we started in 1939, and my family, my, uh, fa my late father and my late great-grandfather, both were ministers in powerful governments, and I think for a combined period of about, about 30 years. So people can ask, you know, why have we not come so far? I would like to speak just numbers. From 1972 till today, we have built 44,000 houses. And on top of that, with this estate infrastructure ministry... We Who's we? Your party? No, any representative from upcountry. I'm not talking about my party. I'm talking about the representatives totally. Any, because there, has been time, there have been times where we've been in the opposition. Yeah, yeah. There have been other characters in the cabinet. So, you know, totally 44,000 houses have been built. And uh, through the... And if, if anybody feels I'm, I'm lying on the facts, they're more than welcome to put an RTI and check these facts out. So 44,000 houses have been built and the government empowers the estate infrastructure ministry to build. Earlier, it was 2,000 houses. Today, due, due to the crisis, it's come down to 800 houses. Other than this, we have 14,000 houses from the Indian housing grant. But one thing I can assure you, and this is something I've communicated to my voters as well, that, see, building a house is not the solution. 
you know, providing a free house is not the solution when they don't have enough economic weight to carry that house. Yeah. So we should look at more options on how we can create opportunities to build a house. And in fact, with the informal sector, we made marvelous strides. Recently, I had seen in the news, especially on social media, there was this viral piece of information that was being, uh, you know, circulated, which was false. They had put up the picture of one particular graduate, this boy from up country, saying that he is the first graduate from uh, up country, from the estates, mm. which was completely false. Today, we have so many graduates out of a population of 1.5 million, only 135,000 are in estate work. Only seven or eight percent of but, that population. But you but one second. Seven or eight percent of uh, in the estate trade. But unfortunately, we have managed to draw an identity for the entire 1.5 million based on that seven or eight percent. Number one. Number two. Everybody says the estate sector is in a pathetic condition only by looking at the place they live in. I'm sure you know you just mentioned yourself the line houses, but I think they should ask why are the houses like that. See, I can, I can assure you one thing. The estate sector workers are more than capable of building their own houses. If they don't build, their children who are working abroad or working in various parts of the world, they'd be more than happy to put money and build. But the primary issue is the companies do not give the workers land to uh, ownership over land. There have been instances where a toilet was demolished by the Planters Association and, the, and that particular company because they didn't believe that uh, land should be given so to the workers. So shouldn't the government intervene there? So the government has tried to intervene. Unfortunately, it was during uh, the late President Ranasinghe Singh Premadas' time this agreement was drawn up. And this lease for 50 years was drawn up in such a way where the government does not have much of a say. I mean, we have the PMMD, which is under the Plantation Ministry, which is in charge as the golden shareholder, with the, the Treasury being at the forefront. But they can't enforce much in the plantation sector. Because, and one more thing, you had mentioned I was in charge for the plantation uh, estate, infrastructure. estate side. I am in charge only for the infrastructure part of it, which I will come to shortly. The Labour Minister is the one who is in charge of the workforce. The people, you know, but who Minister, are... Minister, despite population. the fact that you gave a lot of figures, that is that, I mean, that is commendable, for sure. But the thing is, the conditions, like you mentioned, that these individuals, these families are living in, are, are very, very, uh, you know, below standards. They're not, not right now, I'm not even talking about something that happened 10 years or 15 years back. If we go to places like Kotagala, Talavakale, and all those areas, and if we go and, you know, have a look, they're living in very, I mean, it would have upgraded a little bit. They would have facilities in terms, but the conditions like in one, one house, there is more than uh, around eight, nine, ten people. Uh, you know, sleeping conditions are very bad. But no, if, I, if I may, if I may, again, it boils down to what I mentioned earlier. If tomorrow, ownership of land, not, I'm not asking for land that belongs to anybody else. I'm asking for land where these people have been living for 200 years. Yes. If ownership of land over the land in which they are currently living, the line rooms, if that land is given to the workers, they'd be able to demolish and build where even the government can assist. Or you should give me a solution on the issue that I'm facing. Uh, right now, I need 205,000 houses for the upcountry community. 205,000? This is uh, uh, from the Indian housing project. No, no I need 200, and, there are 205,000 families that are living in line rooms that require housing. So, Minister, let me ask that question. Now, the Indian housing project, which came into this country, I think uh, gave 10,000 houses. Soon after the war ended, they provided, I think, 9,800 or uh, not, around 9,000 no, to the north. They provided totally 50,000 houses. Yeah, from that, there was a chunk that went to the north, and then they gave a small amount, I, I believe. Uh, 4,000 houses were yes, given initially, uh, and then in 2017, Prime Minister Modi had come down to Norelia, and, and he had made a commitment of 10,000. Yeah. Due to the, and to be honest, when, we, when I inherited this ministry, out of the 4,000 houses, only 699 were completed. Exactly. With electricity and water. Yes. The remaining, and apart from that, there were 2,000. Now, those structures. houses, those houses were given uh, on free land. Their entire land was uh, basically was bought over and it but was But they were not given valid deeds. And so then why the government cannot... So that, so that is what we are trying to rectify. This goes back to my first answer where I said, we have to learn from mistakes of the past. Now, out of the 44,000 houses, this ministry has always had a plan to provide deeds. Unfortunately, in the former government, the minister in charge, my predecessor, he, uh, they had not provided deeds, but rather permits. It's not the same thing as a deed. And second thing is, out of the 4,000 houses, I gave the number earlier, that 699 were completed with electricity, water and access roads. 
So when 699 were completed with electricity, water and access roads, these 699 were provided to the workers. Yeah. The remaining was not completed. Now once I had taken over, unfortunately that's when we came face to face with COVID and also the economic crisis. This is not something of my... So, okay, let me ask if, something. If I may just okay. complete my answers, then I think it would yeah. be easier as well. So finally, today we have bought it. Despite economic crisis, we have made sure the 4,000 is almost complete. And we are starting the 10,000 houses pretty soon as well. But again, it goes back to the issue. Even if I complete these 10,000 houses, let's say in about a year, the population is going to increase eventually. It is not going to suffice. This is not a permanent solution. For the what is the permanent workers. solution? The permanent solution is quite simple. One is the ownership over the current land they reside in has to be given to them. Because not in lieu of anything, because of the simple fact that 200 years they've been occupants of that land. And apart from that, companies which had taken over barely 40 years ago with managers who came three years ago can't throw somebody out of the line room because they cease to work in their estate. That is inhumane. Second thing is... But that's happening. No, that, but that's happening again because of exploitation, not because of lack of political representation. So where do these people go to? Sorry, Mahesh, just one second, because I wanted to provide you with a solution which you had asked. See, it's very simple. You have the informal sector living with the estate workers currently. What we are suggesting is those line rooms, uh, give it over to the workers, let them have the residences. They want to demolish, build a toilet, upgrade or have an individual house. It's up to them within that piece of land. The informal sector, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's about creating opportunities. If we were able to come up with the concept of council houses, say by the towns, mm -hmm. then the informal sector could be bought down there and they could be paying rent and they could be living there and eventually become contributors to the economy. If somebody does not have access to economic opportunities, you can't expect them to come up. Stay there, yeah. We are not talking about equality, we are talking about equity. So there is a very big disparity there. Now, I can give you one simple example. There have been so many instances where we have tried taking the land and giving it to the workers where they can build. And we have succeeded in certain areas, but it's, it's an eventual failure if you don't have a blanket mechanism to cover it. Which is why now through the ministry we are coming up with a housing policy. Would that policy continue to be retained in the successive government? Because one of the biggest issues the estate sector had in the past, one minister comes, have a policy, changes when, as soon as he goes out. Uh, there is, I mean, we have to be honest, um, your rival parties, whenever you know someone from your rival party becomes the minister, he will do something completely uh, different to what you've been doing thus far. As soon as you come, you change that. And that back and forth has been happening. Who's suffering is the people. So uh, what is the guarantee that this is also not going to change? I would just like to state something here. It's in the previous government, as you said, when my rival party, you know, their leader had taken over as minister, he had removed the name boards from all our vocational training centers. So just to show you the level of petty politics. <laughs> but when I had taken over, if I wanted, I could have stopped the Indian housing infrastructure because the building is done. I could have stopped the infrastructure and started the 10,000 and done all the openings. But I didn't do that. I continue the work, not because of anything, because this is not a God-given position. We've been elected to this position and we owe first and foremost duty to the uh, to the uh, people who vote for you. So if we want to engage in political vendetta, you know, we can. But at the end of the day, like you said, the losers are the people. But to prevent all that, though we are the bigger union and we are the bigger party, I still made sure that people came first. And I got on the stage of my rival party with the leader of the opposition sitting there. And I mentioned very clearly that Though this is not a political alliance, but up country, because we are a marginalized community, our political representatives need to have an understanding in between each other. We can sit on opposite sides, but there has to be understanding. If we try to do the same politics, which maybe the majority, the majoritarian politicians are trying to do, losers are going to be the people. This is not about the votes. So I can assure you one more thing, the housing policy, when it comes into effect, it will have to be followed, not just by me, but by any of my successors. Uh, whatever, I mean, what we really need is to get those people who have been living in that, you know, very poverty uh, uh, related conditions in that sector has to actually come up. I think it's high time that we bring Sorry that. Sorry if you don't mind me saying, I'd just like to add, see, uh, you know, again and again we are on this narrative, not just us, I mean, generally that. No, this sector for 200 years there's been no improvement, you know, they are suffering. No, I, mean, I, I, I acknowledge I could, that. If I could uh, just say so. We didn't come in here as traders. We didn't come in here as soldiers or 
you know, part of the British infantry. We came here as indentured labor. If you look at the global situation, any country where indentured labor has gone in, it has taken them a long time to get reintegrated into society. And that's the same case here. Today, you know, uh, just to give you an example, in America, with apartheid, I mean, sorry, in Arabi Africa, America, with apartheid, you had 400 years of slavery. And today they are still fighting for their rights. Is it okay for you to tell them, oh, 400 years have yielded no progress? No, progress has happened. But that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we're, we are at the peak of our livelihood. We still need to go a further way. And that's why the president also currently, he is appointing a presidential task force where it's specific to the upcountry uh, community, where they'll be reintegrated back into Sri Lankan society. There are certain policy-wise decisions that need to be taken, which will be taken. Um, indeed. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. A lot more to discuss uh, with uh, Minister Jeevan Thondaman uh, with regard to uh, the economy, uh, politics, and perhaps maybe there might be an election this year, next year. Uh, he might know. I'll just ask him uh, right after this break. You're watching Get Real. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone to Get Real Army Conversation with Minister Jeevan Thundaman, the Minister of Water Supply and Estate Infrastructure. Minister, um, yes, we want the country to be stable, we want the political situation to be stable, but in Parliament, despite the fact that uh, even though we hope for the best, what we see is a lot of cracks. Um, it's not a stable government whatsoever, even though you all try to make it a stable government. We can see there are lots of uh, issues happening with the main party in terms of the Sri Lanka Pudjana Piramuna. Um, you all are uh, an alliance party, um, giving the support to the president in order to uh, continue the current path. Uh, what do you see, like, what is your opinion, being a person who is in the cabinet, uh, do you think, are we um, heading for an election, or what's a, what, what exactly is the real political situation, if you can? Well, if you want me to be uh, quite blunt, I can uh, tell you from my analysis, what I can see is the parliament, it's uh, one of its kind, because, uh, not because of the characters, but rather because of the fact that the, the sense of uh, party loyalty and party politics has more or less disappeared from parliament. It's not about party loyalty or, you know, uh, because uh, to be very honest, if people feel that uh, the opposition is united, I'm sorry, I can assure you the ruling party is far more stable than the opposition. Simply because of, uh, no, I mean, uh, you wanted my honest view, I'm giving you my honest view. Yeah, but, but what, what, we, to, we don't see that, no, no, no I mean, it's no, just, just. No, I, I think you do see that because it's, it's it's like this. When you look at all the actions taken by the government so far, yes. No, we're, we're not talking about the no, action no, no, per no, I'm se. coming to that. Yeah. Actions reflect reputation at the yeah. end of the day, right? So, you know, if you look at all the steps taken by the government in terms of any field, that it be even uh, the PUCSL or, the, you know, the economic reforms or, you know, even in terms of social aspects, whatever steps and actions taken, yes, there have been minor disagreements that is bound to happen between different parties within the ruling party. But at the end of the day, the decision has always come through as per the president's vision. So clearly there is a focal point through which work is being done. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not too sure which you know, uh, parliament composition that you, you're seeing. But no, as far uh, as I'm aware, no as let's far be as, honest, uh, Minister. No, no, I'm being completely honest. As far uh, as I'm aware, when it comes to the opposition, I think there are many members, and I mean this with all due respect, I, I personally feel, and this is something that I think even the public have acknowledged, that there have been many members of the opposition who have in fact given their support to the president. If not, this country wouldn't be run so Yeah, but that itself it shows, but they are not supporting the president in public. They are, they are basically taking so the is, same rhetoric so of no, the opposition. Again, that is their political... No, I mean, uh, that is not what I want to ask you. What I want to ask you is, despite the fact that you say that everything is hunky-dory uh, in the government and, you know, everybody is uh, united, right now what we see, the largest party of the government, the Sri Lanka Pudichana Peramuna, uh, there is a conversation um, in the media which says that certain members are not happy because they did not get uh, uh, ministerial support 
portfolios and they're asking for it. So there is a little bit of a crack on that. And we see that the president asking certain members to come and meet him personally or, or have meetings of, of that nature, uh, not in line, uh, not uh, following the protocols of the, those particular parties in order to call those members and have that. So we see a little bit of cracks because these are not something, I mean, we are not uh, just saying for the sake of saying as we saw it for the first time. These are the things we've been saying, like from 94 onwards, Chandrika Kumarathunga's government, we see little cracks like this appearing and then it becomes big and you head for an election and there, you know, instability once again. Is that the case? I mean, can you honestly tell me that everything is fine in the government? No, no, see, like I said, this is an extraordinary situation, politically even. You know, I don't think we've been faced with uh, a situation where a person gets elected through nationalist and then constitutionally gets elected as president and uh, comes forward in this sense. And also with the crisis, even, you know, I don't think we've seen this situation. So obviously, there will be minor disagreements. I can give you an example that took place recently, why in Bavonia there was a temple issue, right, where they said, no, there's apparently, you know, a cultural conflict over there. Where even within the cabinet, there were disagreements between, in fact, the cultural minister and myself and even Douglas Devananda. But at the end of the day, we were able to communicate it and move forward. So what I'm saying is, I can't speak for, say, the SLPP or anyone else supporting the president. What I can speak for is the stand of my party, myself, and how the government is dealing with these conflicts. So from my end, what I can assure you is, despite there being minor disagreements, these disagreements are being communicated to, uh, to the president. Recently, we had a party leaders meeting, and I think even uh, prior to that meeting, you know, like you said, certain MPs had said that they were unhappy. And after the meeting, the leader of the party, he opened, uh, Honorable Basil Rajapaksha, though he's not in parliament, he had uh, come out and said that no SLPP is supporters to the party. So tomorrow, if I'm my party leader and I support the president, if there's any issues within my party, then it's my responsibility to sort that out. I can't take him to the president. I'm just saying him or her. So at the end of the day, I can, uh, I mean, that, that would be my take on the subject. Uh, will Tomorrow, we see if there are issues with SLPP, then it's purely the responsibility of the SLPP heads to communicate it to the president. And it's about them coming to an understanding. So the CWC is very strong on the fact that they are standing with this president. Correct. Uh, will we see elections this year? Uh, do you want to see elections this year? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, see, uh, you know, this whole, this whole issue, you know, this back and forth, this ping pong of are we having elections, are we not having elections? See, at that particular point of time, to be honest, yes, there were technical... The te local government yes, elections there were, that you... there were technicalities where there were issues and even nominations have been filed, but elections didn't take place. And yes, maybe due to circumstance, what not, whatever you call it. But I think uh, I'm of the view that, uh, you know, as the President rightly said in Parliament as well, that elections should be expected sooner rather than later. And I think uh, that question is not just up to the President, I mean, it's up to all members of parliament and uh, the president to take a decision on that. In a possible as far as I'm concerned, I, again, as far as I'm concerned and the CWC is concerned, I think ideally speaking, yes, the country needs a new set of elections ranging from the presidential to the local government to reset. Question is, when are these elections going to take place? And in our view, we personally feel the presidential election should take place first. Or, you know, uh, given what, say, members of the parliament feel, Let's talk about the presidential election in case, because I think that is uh, 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 the practical thing that can happen if we are to talk about the direction of this nation and who needs to uh, be accountable for that. Uh, in a possible presidential election, uh, will the CWC continuously support the current president or are you, looking, are you still not made up your mind yet? See, I think in politics, there is no such thing as blind loyalty. There's only you know loyalty which benefits that person or that community. That's how... You know, I've seen what's happened so far. So with relation to your question, the answer is, as long as we have faith in the president and his ability to cater to this community, and I'm not talking about freebies or welfare programs or, you know, handouts. I'm talking about visible changes that are permanent, which includes the, well, fixing the, uh, fixing the workforce issues of the upcountry workers for one. Number two, the ability in which they'd be able to reintegrate upcountry community, even the informal sector, into Sri Lankan society. And third, but you know, it's it's more or less the permanent political solution for us. Because today in Sri Lanka, when you speak about ethnic issues, the only uh, issue that's taken into account is the issues of the North and East. The upcountry is usually neglected. But in this case, I think the President's also mentioned and reiterated his firm commitment 
to uh, change transforming up country. The only thing we are here to see is the delivery and how it's done. So, provided that happens, our support would be with the president. Let me uh, end this conversation uh, and ask you a question, if you can answer very quickly. Uh, the 13th Amendment, uh, which came, you know, consecutively because, like you said, when you talk about the ethnic issue, the predominant uh, uh, conversation or the narrative is coming from the North. And, uh, and the Indian government has supported the 13th Amendment long time back and there was a conversation, it needs to be implemented. What is your view on that and what is the CWC's uh, well, the CWC's view, I think that's something I have to sit with my president and chairman and discuss and come back to you. But as far as I'm concerned, my view on the 13th Amendment is it's really quite simple and I think uh, many people are, you know, are either too afraid to speak about it or, you know, they want to dodge it. But the reality is that the 13th Amendment, at the end of the day, it's devolution. It's as simple as that. It's power sharing, which is a healthy sign for any country. But the reality of the matter is the narrative in which it has been brought into Sri Lanka. For example, right now, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you that there are people down south, there are even people in my area, and I'm sure there are people in the North and East who don't even know what the 13th Amendment mm. is. They don't understand what power sharing is. 13th Amendment is not going to help only the Tamils affected by the war. 13th Amendment does not mean, it, you know, implementing it would be a victory for separatists. Not at all. At the end of the day, people need to be made aware of what the 13th Amendment is, that it is simple power sharing. Because only, because Sri Lanka, see, this whole argument about this country belongs to me, this country, this country belongs to everyone at the end of the day. It's a country where, you know, we have to understand that the fabric is diverse. And certain sections of society are concentrated in certain areas in this country, geographically. So when that's the case, the 13th Amendment in its essence would allow people in that particular region limited control over the power that's uh, being coming to them in terms of resources. So there's nothing wrong in that. That doesn't mean they are a separate country. They are still part of Sri Lanka. And they are Sri Lankans. It just depends on how it's done. So the reason I mention that is, there's only two reasons why it's being opposed. One is because many people don't understand the 13th Amendment. And another reason is because it was con it's considered as something bought in by a foreign power, which is to an extent true. true. Yes. And uh, those two are the only issues. So I personally think the 13th Amendment or devolution as a concept itself should be put to Parliament, ask the flow what, you know, what each person's you know, uh, outward stand is. Because right now, the 13th Amendment is more or less being used as a tool to you know, funnel more hatred, funnel more communalism, when in reality the 13th Amendment should be explained to the people. Then after that, a decision needs to be taken on whether it should be uh, in force or not. I mean, apart from that, it's still a part of the law. It's, uh, it's yes. a joke if you ask me that it's a, it's a, it's a, a piece of law is not being enforced, you know, yeah. it's... Uh all right. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, Minister of uh, Estate, uh, Infrastructure and Water Supply, uh, Jivan Thornavani, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for you tonight. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, well, once again, next week, uh, I'll be back uh, with another guest, which uh, will bring you a different uh, side uh, to the story. Thank you for watching. Have a good night. I looked all over the world And there's every type of girl But your empty eyes seem to pass me by Leave me dancing on with myself So let's sink another drink Cause it'll give me time to think If I had the chance I'd ask a woman to dance And not be dancing on with myself oh, oh.